Um, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you and congratulate you on your careers and also welcome you to AEI. Um, I have been at AEI now for two years. As uh, Beth said, I was a, a former commissioner of social services in New York City and New York State. And I've had a kind of a, you know, adjustment to this think tank world here in Washington. And, um, but one of the things I like about it is that we're always constantly reading and seeing new ideas and, and new, new, new material comes across your desk every day. And we get, in fact, a morning, a morning briefing at 6.30 in the morning, you know, the hottest things on AEI that AEI scholars are produced or put up. And this morning was an interesting one. I went to it this morning and it was, sometimes they do this sort of blast from the past. And the headline that I read was, there was a picture of Ronald Reagan and Gerald Ford, so old picture, so it comes from 1976 or maybe before then. And the headline was, and this is sort of an AEI hot article that was published at that time, GOP smart to opt for Ford over Reagan. Governor Ronald Reagan has run an admirable campaign against President Gerald Ford. What remains clear to those in the know, however, is that Reagan has no prospects of winning a general election anytime soon. And I thought, oh, gosh, I'm so glad to hear that AEI scholars back then were as dumb as some of the ones around here today. You know, that we even, they made mistakes too, you know, of course, I don't mean dumb, but you know, it made me feel good they could make a mistake. And then, of course, I clicked on it, and what did I get? April Fools. So I, I was totally a sucker. So I want you to know, I had to tell an April Fools joke, and that was the best one I could come up with. I was thinking of coming up and saying that I just read on Twitter that Donald Trump has dropped out of the race, but that would have been too good to be true. <laughs> um, so uh, I am a former commissioner of social services in New York City and New York State. I was in the, that business uh, running the, the large public assistance programs, Medicaid, public, uh, public assistance, uh, cash welfare, food stamps, child care assistance for 18 years before coming here to start a unit called po the uh, Poverty Studies Unit here at, HR, at, at AEI and to sort of produce work of commenting and discussing the big issues facing our major social assistance programs. And the topic of today's discussion is um, health and poverty. And there are a lot of concepts and topics in that world, as I'm sure you know. The intersection and with regard to health uh, issues and poverty are very broad. People who are poor suffer from disproportionate amount of dis disease and difficulties, and the extent to which the the world of health and the world of poverty fighting intersects and, and works well together is important and I think is actually becoming a bigger issue. Uh, for instance, in pediatrics, there's a much greater interest in getting pediatric uh, doctors involved in assessing uh, children when they meet them, not just on their health issues, but also on what's going on in their socioeconomic issues in their household and what can be addressed there. That's an interesting topic. It is, however, not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the way in which someone who was in the business of, of managing these multiple programs looked at the largest uh, public assistance program for poor Americans, uh, and that is Medicaid, which is a major factor in anyone who's in the business of health care. And actually, it's a major factor in all Americans' life. Um, and and, and so, so you get a sense of the perspective from someone from where I sat of where Medicaid sits in that world. Can I have that, please? Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and how, we, how we interacted with it, how we dealt with it, how we related to it, and then, you, and then some of the major issues that come up in that discussion. Now, I have to say, the other thing about my discussion is that it's very much about the way things are. You're going to hear from other people later today, and they may uh, uh, wander off into the way things could be or how things could be much better, especially if we move toward more Marcus-based solutions. And I'd like to do that, and I agree with all of that. I think that would be a good thing to do. But, but today, I'm going to talk to you today just on how things are really as they exist and, and how, what they look like from the perspective of someone running social services programs in the state of New York and New York City. So the very first thing that you need to know about Medicaid is that it's big. It is, it is by far the largest program serving poor Americans in the United States. It's not even close. As you can see by this chart, the big gray semicircle that comes all the way around and almost closes uh, is all of Medicaid spending, uh, $299.7 billion a year. That's just federal. There's a whole other big state share that would make the size of Medicaid even larger in comparison to something like, for instance, the TANF program, which is at $14 billion, or the SNAP program at $74 the earned income tax credit, often talked about as a major program for the poor, is at $66 billion. 
and the child care development fund is at six billion. So child care is at six, Medicaid is at 299. Um, in New York City, I used to say that, that, that the gross federal, state, and local spend on Medicaid, a program for poor people, a poverty fighting program, uh, was $30 billion a year, and the spending on uh, cash welfare was less than one, and child care assistance less than 500 million. So you get a sense of the disproportionate size that Medicaid takes up in the world that we live in when we talk about poverty. And the other thing to know about that is that, or to be conscious about that, is that um, there's two other things to be conscious about that. And that is that um, the first is, is, is that um, the power that goes with that enormous amount of spending is enormous. So for instance, uh, when I would testify in the state legislature in New York State, and this is true of any Buddy in the social services business, and I was testifying on a Medicaid issue. The interests that were that were focused on what was going to happen with that legislation, whether it was a tax or a regulation or some aspect of government policy, were the hospitals, the providers, the healthcare managed care plans, everybody in the healthcare industry, and they were powerful, very well funded. The strongest, most powerful lobbyists in the state were there. Um, and the interests, uh, but on the other poverty programs, the programs that were like cash welfare or child care, and I'm not crying uh, wolf for them, but I would like to say, there's nowhere near the match. It's an entirely different setup. It was a few scruffy advocates and me uh, when I was focusing on those programs, but when I went up and testified on a Medicaid issue, the, the health care industry, uh, powerful, important, significant part of the economy of the state of New York or any state, was always there to protect its interests and to fight for its for its goals. The other thing is the is the extent to which, and I think you, you all are surely aware of this, is that we live in a very difficult fiscal situation in the United States. So every spare dollar is difficult to come by. And for those of us in the social services world broadly, and remember, I I had Medicaid under me. I, I ran the program to determine eligibility for Medicaid. I was responsible for certain aspects of it. I was also the commissioner to, to Mayor Bloomberg. And so the overall care and nurturing of poor New Yorkers was important to me. So I, I cared about the Medicaid program. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that if you want to find savings in welfare policy or in programs for the poor, it's very hard to find savings anywhere else. You may find savings in the other programs. But the real, um, the real, you go, kind of like Willie Sutton in the banks, you go where the money is if you want to find savings. And Medicaid is by far the biggest. And, uh, and the last thing is, occasionally you will hear uh, with certain rhetoricians and politicians and others, they will talk about the $800 billion spending on poverty in the United States, or the trillion dollar spending when they add local and state spending on poverty in the United States. And, and they won't mention the extent to which that's vastly Medicaid. And it's important to remember that because um, Medicaid spending, by and large, well, to, does not go to poor people. It goes to healthcare providers and managed care plans. And so uh, it's, it's when you talk to some Americans, when they hear $800 billion spent on the poor, they have some sense that there's a bunch of transfer programs and cash welfare food stamp benefits, things that are going into the back pocket of poor Americans, when in fact a bu big chunk of it is not going into their back pocket. It may not be going to the best spending of all time, but it's not going to them. And it's hard for an individual uh, to really, uh, an individual health care recipient in the Medicaid program to, um, to abuse or to, to manipulate or to take advantage of, of the Medicaid program. We're going to talk about that in a minute, a little later, but just be aware of that. So sometimes the statistics uh, and the rhetorics about, about spending on the poor forgets to mention that a vast majority of it is in healthcare, by and large. The last thing I want to mention uh, has to do with the sort of incentives. You all, I'm sure, are aware of this, but it just cannot be stated enough that the way in which these various federal po poverty programs are funded is different. Some are block granted, some are based on a percentage of spending, some have caps, some are entitlements. The way in which Medicaid is spent, spent at the states is through what's something called the FMAP. And the FMAP is basically state decides what to spend on, and the feds reimburse a percentage of that. So in New York State, I think we had the lowest FMAP at 50 percent. Other states range up to 80 or uh, 85 percent. But the federal government will reimburse spending on Medicaid at a percentage. 
That is an incentive to spend for the state because the fact of the matter is if you, if you can spend uh, 50 cents on something and get a dollar worth of services and economic activity, you'll do it. Be and if you can do it at 70 cents, it's even better. So the way in which the original sin of the Medicaid program, and one in which AEI scholars are often writing about and wishing we could change, if we could change one thing, this would probably be it, is that sort of flat reimbursement rate for any state that does not provide an incentive to save or to, or to spend appropriately. Um, the economic interest and the economic desire, uh, I work for Governor Pataki, and he was a great reformer and a great fiscal, uh, uh, or tried to be in his early years, a fiscal conservative, and he was a welfare reformer. He felt that the state of New York was government spend on, on low-income programs was too much and wasn't effective. But he pretty soon found out that Medicaid was by far the biggest and that it was also a huge driver of economic activity in the state and a huge force in jobs and in, um, uh, and, in, and in economic activity in every part of the state. And so it was hard for him to turn to Medicaid in that regard because of its size. And then when you add, for every dollar you spend, 50 cents picked up by the federal government, what's the big deal? You can have a drive to increase spending, which is bad. So that's the first big thing to remember when talking about uh, health care and the poor is that Medicaid is a program for poor Americans, and it is by far the biggest program for poor Americans, uh, far and away. Uh, the second, uh, the, and I just, just one other thing, just as this shows the, the recipients, uh, just so you get another sense, it's also the one that has the most recipients. Um, and uh, I think I've got their food stamps, which is second, and EITC, which is third. But, you know, uh, Medicaid is now up over uh, almost 70 million Americans. Um, food stamps is at 46. EITC is about 30. And then, of course, cash welfare is down to hardly anything, less than five, and child care is even less than that. So again, you get a sense of the enormous reach of the Medicaid program in the United States. For better or worse, sometimes I think for worse, but, it is, is, but the size need cannot be, under, uh, under, cannot, cannot be uh, described enough. Um, I'll leave that up there for a little longer. The second big topic addresses an issue that Beth mentioned, and that is, and this is also not well known, and I think that some people uh, view it slightly differently, and it's complicated, but Medicaid has become a work support. In the United States today, poverty programs are very heavily focused on um, working Americans. They're, that We made a decision in the 90s that we wanted, that we believed as a country, that we wanted to help low-income Americans, but we really wanted to help low income Americans who tried to help themselves. And if they helped the, tried to help themselves, but still were at or close to the poverty line, 150% of the poverty line, somewhere in there, it gets higher and higher every year. But if they were still struggling, Americans felt comfortable providing them assistance to make work pay. And Medicaid is very much a part of that world. In New York City, as I said, the vast majority of the people on Medicaid, adults on Medicaid, were working people who were working for employers that would not provide insurance and that they somehow were able to do, um, their income was low enough to qualify. So Medicaid is work support. Now, it's not the only work support. We supplement wages with the earned income tax credit. We provide food stamps benefits. We provide housing assistance and we provide childcare assistance. So it's part of a, a bunch of work supports and it doesn't always work to support work. Sometimes the combination of these various forms of assistance can lead Americans to work less or work not at all. So the theory from the left's perspective is, well, it's a work support, so we got to be for it. Come on, let's do more of it. But the fact of the matter on the street and on the, on the ground, and I, I saw it in New York, and you can see it in the labor force participation numbers, many people, are, many people that are in this world can see, well, you know, if I've got health insurance for my kid and I've got food stamp benefits, and I, in, in May or June, I'm going to get an earned income tax credit because I worked four months last year. I might not have to work 40 hours this week. Or I might be able to take a couple months off that not particularly great retail job at Duane Reed that I didn't particularly like while I sort of get my act together. So these work supports don't always support work. Sometimes they replace work. But the theory is that we're providing assistance to people who can be working, that it's not about only about um, destitute folks who are not working or off the off the um, uh, off the lay out of the labor market entirely, and that has led to its growth. By the way, as the percentages eligibilities have risen and the, the the front door screens have been lessened, 
more and more people have come on who are working but are also um, uh, view themselves as poor or poor enough to qualify for the Medicaid program. Uh, the other one last point about that. In the old days, back in the pre-1990s period, when you went off cash welfare, you lost Medicaid. Uh, is that welfare and Medicaid went together. So this benefit program that went to non-working single moms um, was tied to Medicaid. And if you got a job, you lost your Medicaid and, um, and you lost your TANF because you didn't need the cash anymore. That was changed by the 1996 law, and that's another reason why we call it more of a work support. So the, 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 the requirement that you had to be not working and on cash welfare to get Medicaid left a lot of people not working and on cash welfare. When you broke that, we were able to help a lot of people get off of cash welfare, save an enormous amount of, in its perspective, money in TANF, the, the TANF, the, the cash welfare program is at the same level it was in 1996, $16 billion a year. That's amazing in the, given that everything else in the government has grown. That program has not moved an inch. In New York State, we, we once showed Governor Pataki a chart of programs where he had actually, where spending had gone up in his term of 12 years. And cash welfare was the only one that went backwards, went downward. So we, we definitely did something about cash welfare but we blew up the other side of work supports. So I just wanted to make that point as well. Now, the next point, uh, staying on sort of major themes in Medicaid and, and healthcare, is that it's important to know that the eligibility rules for all of these programs are all different. And they require uh, talking to often different people in different agencies in different buildings and communicating with them using different data sets and maybe even different you know, nomenclature. Um, and that's complicated and difficult and uh, awful that we've allowed this to happen, but it is true. All of the programs, for instance, the ones there, they're run by different federal funding streams that come down that have different hierarchies of leadership that are very protective of their world. And Medicaid is one of the biggest in that regard. Medicaid is large, it's important, it's tied to the healthcare industry, it's run by CMS here in Washington. They're going to run their program the way they want to run their program. They're not going to run the, their program the way the food stamp program is run. The food stamp program's goals may be different. The food stamp program's pressures may be different. They're not going to run it the way the TANF welfare program is run or the child care program. They're going to run it the way they want to run it. And as a result, um, the eligibility rules are different so that a person applying for any one of these programs for the poor can find himself facing much different rules and incentives from the agency. So if you are a Medicaid enrollment officer dispatched to or employed by a hospital in a major city, what is your interest? Sign them up. Because when they are in front of you, they are probably getting care at your hospital. And your hospital administrators, wisely, would rather have them be in an insurance program where they're going to get some reimbursement than in the charitable care uh, bucket. So the incentive of the worker to look carefully at your income data, make sure you submit all the documentation, uh, is, not, is not the same as it might be in a cash welfare program where we're strongly focused on getting people off of cash welfare and into the labor market, where the incentives from the, from the officers of the agency, for better or for worse, I happen to think it's for better, are to help people get to self-sufficiency and independence. But a Medicaid enrollment officer does not have that incentive. And they often don't work for the, the, you know, the, the paying entity. They work for the receiving entity. They might work for the provider. So it's important to understand that. And the rules are different. So you know, it, for one program, you might have to show pay stubs for two previous uh, pay periods. For another program, you might be able to just self-attest. In fact, in the Medicaid program, self-attestation on income is allowed. I think it's ridiculous but it is something that they do. And again, it's partly because the interest is to get people enrolled and to enroll people in Medicaid. Um, and that's part of the reason why the program is so different, so much in size. Uh, interesting, uh, another uh, topic that I found in my years in New York State that were interesting to observe and to watch, and that I'm sure, as you all, in, who healthcare providers, would be aware of. And I'll just tell you my perspective. I, I, again, I was on the eligibility side the care side, the quality side, is often run by a different agency, the Department of Health or the hospital. 
Uh, while I was on the board of the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, I was not actually a provider of health care. I was an enroller in Medicaid. But um, the managed care revolution, or what, what at least what I saw in New York, was significant. It, it had a big role, and it appears to have put some constraints on costs over many years. New York State is the worst spender in Medicaid in the state, in the country by far, but we got a little better because we went to, and we've continued to go to aggressive managed care enrollment. But it did enter into the world another entity. You had the providers, you had the age, government agencies enrolling people, you had the clients, and now we have the managed care plans. And the managed care plans are another powerful interest uh, in the state, and they want to also enroll people. And to the extent that they are in the business of being allowed to enroll people, which they are, um, their incentive is to get people on. And the other thing is, is that they, of course, have a deep incentive, as I'm sure you know, to enroll people who are healthy because they get their capitated payment every month no matter what. <coughs> so this is an interesting topic. In New York State, the counties pay a share of the Medicaid costs every year. Fee-for-service had all kinds of problems with it. We acknowledge that. didn't control costs very well. There were some issues. But for children, fee-for-service wasn't so bad. They don't get sick that often. They're pretty healthy. Managed care required these poor counties with low tax bases to make a monthly payment every month for everybody in their uh, Medicaid enrollment, uh, uh, on their rolls in Medicaid. And that forced them a fiscal pressure on the, on the county and the state that we, I don't think they were prepared for. So managed care, uh, I think, has been... Um, very, uh, has had some great positives in terms of controlling costs, but it has some downsides. And it introduces a new entity whose interests I'm not so sure are always clean. And just to give you another topic on that, managed care plans don't have the best interest in making sure that people who are no longer in the state or alive or still on man Medicaid are st on their roll. They don't clean their, they don't close cases very well. Source of big problem. Because to the extent that they're still on the rolls and they're on their list, the state's going to write that check and it's going to come to them every month for that patient or that uh, Medicaid recipient, whether they get care or not. And there's, a, there's uh, issues there that uh, need to be uh, and, and have become problematic in many places. Uh, the next come issue is probably the issue that you all care the most about because you care the most about the important things and that is quality. And I have to tell you that from my perspective, 18 years in New York State and New York City, um, now admittedly, we were a very big spender in Medicaid. Um, the general perception of the public, the press, the attention, the focus of the constituency group was never on quality. It was always on enrollment and access to the program which I thought was an enormous compliment to the healthcare industry in the United States, in, in New York. That it, that why is it that this active, uh, aggressive, difficult, difficult electorate full of advocates that would be loving to come protesting down my offices or the offices of any one of the public officials, why is it that so rarely were there issues about quality in Medicaid care for, uh, for uh, care for Medicaid recipients in our hospitals and in our providers? And I think the reason is is because it was pretty good. I think the reason is, 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 is um, it was not necessarily, it almost surely wasn't, equal to private insured uh, care or care that someone who is wealthy can get. But you know, equal is a big thing. And in the, in the world that I play in, I want people to get to a minimum standard that's acceptable, that's appropriate, that's right. But to promise equality, it seems to me, violates even free market principles. We acknowledge that people are going to be willing to pay more or less, and that may lead to different quality outcomes. But the fact of the matter is, is that I was surprised. Um, and then when I came to AI, I found that often when the scholars here, and you're going to hear from a couple of them talk about Medicaid, they like to call it second-class care. And, that in, and it's their effort to use rhetoric that will appeal to people that will make them want to reform Medicaid to change Medicaid because of the fiscal pressures, the pressures on providers, because of the fact that it doesn't really control costs or have people have a, a stake in the game. There are lots of things wrong with Medicaid. But they would throw into it 
this assertion that Medicaid care is second class or lower class or in, inadequate. To me, I, in my experience in New York, I did not see that. That's not to say that, you know, in the Health and Hospitals Corporation, that I think the patient base was about 70% Medicaid, that we weren't, uh, we didn't have issues and we didn't face problems. But, but I got the feeling that whatever regulatory forces and whatever professional forces that were at work in the healthcare industry uh, provided uh, care that was uh, uh, appropriate and something to be proud of. So that was how I saw it in New York. It may be different in other parts of the state. But I, what, I, what I caution against is uh, people who are, are, are going to say that if we're going to, have, uh, if we're going to provide health care for, for poor Americans and we're going to subsidize it in some way, that it ought to be equal to whatever other kind of care is out there. I don't, I don't, I don't reject that because I'm mean and difficult and unpleasant. I reject it because I just don't think it's realistic. I don't think it's practical. Um, but in any case, uh, from my perspective, 20 years in New York, I, I really I can't think of a time when I saw a major outrage over quality issues in the state legislature and the city council when it came to Medicaid. So there was, and then there's one other thing. Too many Americans, and too many of the New Yorkers that I work with in my welfare offices, the value of Medicaid is the security of the insurance, is knowing they have the card knowing that when their kid is sick, they can go in and they're not going to get hassled, that they have a place to go, that they have a doctor, mm -hmm. and that they, they, that they are part of a community that will provide care to them. And they may have to wait two hours. They may face difficulties, but they're in the door, and they like that. Americans like to know they have an insurance card in their back pocket, and that includes poor Americans on Medicaid. So to some extent, what they were more concerned about was how do I get the card? Not, once I got the card, the care was inadequate. That was my experience. Um, now, a couple of question, prob problems with quality, however. Having said that I think quality is good, there is a huge issue with regard to Medicaid that I hope all of you in your futures and in your careers will take on. And that is we don't do enough to help poor Americans on Medicaid have better health behavior and health habits about the way in which they care for themselves and their families. This is true in other contexts, whether it's in preschool or parenting. I'm a big believer in just being, not being truthful about the fact that we need help from the patient. We need help from the client. We need personal responsibility. And in cash welfare, we insist on it. And we have penalties. If you're not willing to do certain things, we will terminate your benefit. And we will make you uh, be in a certain place at a certain time to show that you're making an effort. We don't have that in, in Medicaid enough. We need to do more to have the recipient of me Medicaid uh, coverage have some understanding that their actions matter a lot. And if they're not willing to take certain actions that are associated with better care for themselves and their families, that maybe they won't get some benefit. I don't know that you necessarily have to penalize, but you can offer uh, uh, carrots as well and, uh, uh, to get people to incentivize better behavior. Because as I think you are aware, I'm sure you were, at least I, I the pa patient behavior matters a lot in healthcare. So, a couple of things I would recommend about that. Russ, my friend Russ Sykes and E.J. McMahon at the Manhattan Institute wrote a paper a few years ago about how to bring personal responsibility into Medicaid. And also in Indiana, Governor Pence and his team have the, uh, really a, an in innovative, uh, 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 which they got through CMS, which is the federal oversight agency, that allows them to have the Medicaid recipient have some stake in the game, some sense because they're making a payment as well as receiving a benefit, that they are part of the deal and that they need to pay attention. And then finally, the last, and this is the most depressing thing of all. I almost didn't want to put this on here, but I felt that I, I felt I, I obligated to do this uh, because I, 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 you know, this is my opportunity to sort of tell you what I dealt with the most when it comes to and what I was concerned about the most and what I observed the most, and that is um, there is fraud and abuse in Medicaid and in Medicare too. There's fraud and abuse in a major program for poor people in America. It's bad and it costs the federal government and state governments billions, billions of dollars every year. And it is caused by providers of health care. Not good providers, not any of you I'm sure, but that is where the fraud and abuse is. Overbilling, billing for 100 patients when you only saw seven, 
falsifying of records, false claims act violations, putting more people on the rolls than are really exist, managed care plan violations. And there is an organized effort at the Department of Justice and HHS to uh, crack down on it. And as someone who has run an agency that had far-flung tentacles all over the city and was uh, the recipient of a False Claims Act allegation, I urge everyone in this business to be conscious of it and to have compliance efforts and audit efforts to be sure that whatever it is, people in whatever organizations you work in are being sure that their billing practices are correct. Because the uh, United States Attorney's off General's Office and HHS care a lot about this. They've invested a lot of effort in that. They re issue a report every year reporting on three, four billion dollars a year recovered to the federal treasury through False Claims Act allegations and uh, proceedings and, 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 uh, and, and they happen and they're significant and they are big dollars. And one other aspect of them that I'm sure you're also aware of is the key TAM feature where a, a whistleblower who works in anything can file a claim and if the federal district court, federal court or, or federal prosecutor's office views it as being meritorious and then picks it up and pursues it, that whistleblower is, is able to receive 15, 16, 20 percent of the proceeds of the finding and the findings have treble damages associated with it. So in the False Claims Act litigation that I was involved in, a whistleblower in a far-flung little corner <laughs> Of a, of a program that I had some responsibility for, walked away at the end of the proceedings with $12 million. So it's not a small aspect of the world in which you all are going into. Um, I should also say that there's been a lot of more, a, a significant more interest and attention paid to, and I recommend this to you, to the issue of hot spots in, in healthcare usage, where in which by using data, Medicare or Medicaid can see <coughs> Excuse me. Communities where a disproportionate amount of health care uh, uh, procedures are taking place that would be consistent with the demographics of that area. They, they pursue that, and they like to see what's going on. And in addition, I thought one of the most interesting little aspects of journalism in the last couple years was the Wall Street Journal sued CMS for access to all of their records about every provider of Medicare services in the United States. So they, as journalists, could do their own assessment of the billing practice of every doctor in the United States. And they wrote a variety of stories on them, which won them prizes in the journalism world. The point is, is that there's a lot of attention being paid to, attention you may not like, I may not like, or may be troubling to you, being paid to the extent to which Medicare and Medicaid pay such a large portion of the health care bill in the United States, and in paying that large portion of the health care bill, they're paying a big chunk of our federal spending every year, and efforts to be sure that it's done correctly are, are, are out there and widespread. So those are some of the issues that I uh, faced as commissioner in New York City, and I think what I'll do now is stop and take questions and, and comments, and maybe we can have a little dialogue. Let me just get a glass of water. I guess that was kind of impressive. Um, are these on? Okay, good. Who's got questions? Thank you very much for your talk, Mr. Doerr. Sure. Um, so a headline I've seen over and over related to your section on quality is that Secretary Burwell says by 2018, 80% of Medicare and Medicaid payments will be tied to value-based outcomes. But I don't know much of what that means. Yeah. What does that mean for quality? And do you think that opens up or closes off more routes for that waste, fraud, and abuse? Well, th this is, uh, you're straining my knowledge base here. As again, I'm not so much in the payment to the providers world as, as Secretary Burwell is as since she runs CMS. But there is no question that in my time at HH, HHC and at HRA and observing the practices, there was a lot of, there's, there's, a, there's a hot new feeling in the sort of chattering classes in Washington and academic world that we pay for procedures and not for outcomes. And we pay for, um, you know, we don't pay for quality. How well do you do at keeping the patient healthy or out of the hospital? And I, that's what she's talking about. She's talking about ways to have payment streams to providers that are based on again, uh, that, that reward you 
for the most obvious is readmissions. The lower readmissions, holding down costs, getting outcomes, keeping patients out of the hospital, you're going to get a bonus for that. I think it's about that, is how they can pay for quality in regards to the outcome for the patient. Did they, were they healthier, longer, and did they need less further follow-up care, um, as opposed to paying for the 50 times they come in and, and see the hospital and get a procedure. Um, that's what it's about. I am a little uh, skeptical in my experience with CMS and with the federal government that they're going to be able to pull this off as quite as beautifully as they say. Having said that, I do want to say that, you know, if we look back at the last 10 years uh, or five years, one of the nicest things that's happened, it hasn't saved us, but it's been a little bonus, is that the trajectory of healthcare spending, which was going like this, started going like this. And whatever you may want to say about President Obama, during his administration, the healthcare cost curve did bend. Now, whether it was because of things that happened five years before or things outside of his control, I don't know, probably, frankly. But the fact of the matter is, is that the health care cost w curve was bent, and it's their position that more that they pay for quality, for outcomes, the, the better control they'll have on costs. Over here. Yes. Thank you for your, for your talk. Um, I want to ask you about uh, your, your thoughts on provider taxes. Uh, as I understand it, these are taxes on, on physicians and hospitals and nursing homes that where the, the money that's raised goes back into the state Medicare program, yeah. as far as I can tell, for the reason to get the federal matching, right? which kind of seems like a, like almost like a state-sponsored kind of abuse Rip almost, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so I, yeah. I wonder, wanted to get your thoughts yeah, on that. Yeah. It's common practice in states, and I think the feds have passed legislation to limit it, and the legislation has been passed to prevent states from raising their Medicaid share through provider taxes. Not all, but they, there is a, a pushback against it. And it's problematic, but the, the, the states are, are, uh, are facing fiscal pressures of their own, and they need to find ways to raise revenue. And you know, putting a tax on healthcare providers is something they've found that they can do. The feds have tried to limit that and, and, and reduce it. Um, maybe they should do more of that. Um, I'll give you another example. In New York State, not only do they put a tax on providers, they also require a local share. So for a long time, 50% of the state share of Medicaid was paid by the, the state, but 25, excuse me, 25% was paid by the state and 25% was paid by the counties. And every county got their own allocation. And right, and that got, that got to a point where the Medicaid share of a small county's uh, 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 costs was 100% of their budget. They had no other money for anything else. So there's been an effort to reduce that. So the state itself has to come up with its share. It can't put it off on some interest group that it can pick on, like providers or counties. Um, there's a, Congress, a candidate for Congress in upstate New York who's thinking of introducing legislation that would prohibit that action on the part of the state. All of those things are meant to make the state have to think before it uh, uh, imposes another burden on, on another cost in the Medicaid program, because they can't find a way to pay for it some easy way. Thank you. Um, aside from uh, changing the way that the federal government uh, reimburses states for uh, Medicaid spending, if you could propose a, one single reform to the program, uh, at the state level, what would it be? An asset test, a mandated asset test, and a much uh, tougher income test at the front door. So I ran all these programs, and I know that the way in which you should deal with someone applying for benefit is that they should come in and see you. They should present their documentation. This sounds bureaucratic. It sounds kind of unpleasant and kind of a hassle, but I believe it's the way you get it right and you make sure that what they're telling you is the truth and you have an ability to check, and then you, you provide assistance of this kind to people that have just who, that have, to, have shown to you that they are truly eligible. And I think that on, on that side, that would be the thing that I would be most interested in doing from the eligibility determination process. To me, in Medicaid, the pressure has been for some time now, this goes back, Obama certainly, George uh, Bush wasn't that great on this either, was 
roll, enroll them. You know, it's a work support. It's okay. It's not cash welfare. It's not really one of those bad programs. It's a good program. And when that pressure is put on agencies that do the enrollment, they don't follow the rules, or there aren't any rules anymore. And you know, you can take electronic applications where you've never seen the person. You don't, you know, it's hard to verify. They may say we've got great back end checks. Don't believe it. So my view is, is the front door should be much stronger. And you will get enormous pushback from people that will say that's a hassle, it's too much. People have to take time off of work. They're going to have to come down to an office. They may have to stand in line. But I would say it's, you have to do the things like that to make sure you properly determine eligibility. Now, that's on the eligibility side. On the provider side, I am a big supporter of more of this effort to look at data analytics about hotspots and about billing practices. For a long time, and still today, the entire focus of the Medicaid agency in New York State was to pay the providers as rapidly as possible. And I can understand that. I, I agree with that. These are, you know, and the, the image in their mind was these, you know, clinics in poor communities that if they didn't get their money, they would have to shut down and not be able to provide care. Um, but that impetus to get the money out the door led to virtually no back-end review of bills or claims as they came in. So I, my view is, is that if you're a payer of $30 billion worth of claims, you ought to have some more practices to be sure that you're not paying a transportation Medicaid provider in Brooklyn 17 times what they really should get paid for the services they provided. And um, so I, 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 but again, you know, every time someone like me or others say these things, there are enormous interests that say, wait a minute, I'm an honest provider. I never did anything wrong. I'm sending in my claims. I got to get paid. How dare you even suggest? But the fact of the matter is, evidence shows that there are, it's like in welfare, you know, there are, there are bad actors out there. And I think that the efforts to, efforts to uh, monitor the payments could be better. Um, yeah, but those would be a couple. We have time for one more question. Yes. Is there, okay. There you go. Solo private practitioner for 20 years. Would you comment on the moral paradox of compensation for quality? Quality being defined by the terms that are delivered to us now by CMS. And I can give you an example if you'd yeah, like. Sure. I'm a general surgeon. And sometimes a very sick person will say perforated appendicitis, somebody who comes in three to five days sick, belly full of pus, might need a return trip to the operating room for quality care. Right. Whereas I'm going to be penalized. And I never imagined that right. I would find myself deciding between the penalty that I was going to get for doing what was right yeah. and doing what's right for the patient. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the, uh, to the concerns of providers who are dealing with a nameless, faceless, heartless bureaucrat bureaucracy, and, I, and also a cheap bureaucracy. You know, I under, we didn't talk about reimbursement rates. I'm very aware that reimbursement rates are lower than cost and lower than what private insurance pays. So I, I'm conscious of that. Um, and I wish we had a different world for that circumstance. Um, so I, my view is, is that, um, you know, I, I don't know that as CMS is going to be able to implement this kind of heavy top-down control that gets to the right outcomes the way they say it will. I, I <clears throat> Yeah. That lists me as a substandard physician because I had a difficult case and had to go through a series right. of steps that are considered uh, poor quality when in fact it's high quality. Yep, I, I don't I don't um, I, I acknowledge I feel your pain, I, I feel I know what you mean and I'm being a, a a victim of the bureaucracy myself, I know what that's like. Um, but um, I think the impetus is goes to these costs. They, they, the, the, the size of the spend is so great 
uh, that they're trying to find ways to do more with less, which is hard.